My name is Amir Ahmed. Uh, I serve as Vice Provost for Inclusive Excellence here at University of Vermont, which is the Senior Diversity Officer role here at the University. We are so grateful that you have uh, decided to join us this morning for the Andrew Harris Legacy Reception. Uh, we have a wonderful program here uh, this, uh, this morning, uh, and as part of our uh, program, we'll be honoring Dr. Angela E. Batista, and we're excited that she's here with us today. Before we begin, we want to begin with the university's land acknowledgement. The campus of University of Vermont sits within a place of gathering and exchange, shaped by water and stewarded by ongoing generations of indigenous peoples, in particular, the, West, the Western Abenaki. Acknowledging the relations between water, land, and people is in harmony with the mission of the university. Acknowledging the serious and significant impacts of our histories on indigenous peoples and their homeland is a part of the university's ongoing work of teaching, research, and engagement, and an essential reminder of our past and interconnected futures for the many of us gathered on this land. UVM respects the indigenous knowledge interwoven in this place and commits to uplifting the indigenous peoples and cultures present on this land and within our community. And here in this community, we are uh, each year, we honor the legacy of Andrew Harris, the first African-American student uh, and graduate of University of Vermont. And each year we honor uh, a member of the UVM family uh, who embodies that legacy. Uh, and before I uh, invite our uh, provost and soon to be interim president, uh, to the stage, I just want to share something personal uh, about uh, my own observation and experience of Dr. Angela uh, Batista that extends far before my time here at University of Vermont that started just over three years ago. Um, as a person who has been working in higher education over two decades, uh, Angela Batista is well known in my profession. I've known uh, of Angela far before my time here uh, because she is a well-respected leader and trailblazer in the field of higher education administration and student affairs. Uh, and so it just so happened upon me coming to University of Vermont that I learned that she was an alum and that she has these extensive ties. Uh, but I have long admired her and her work. And as a spouse of a Dominicana, Afro-Latina from the Harlem River Projects, Dr. Shelly Perdomo Ahmed, who is now Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs at UMass Amherst, I can attest uh, personally to the, 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 the example that she has set for Latinas and Afro-Latinas throughout higher education. And with that, uh, we have our, again, we are fortunate to have our Provost and Senior Vice President, uh, Patty Prelock, and again, soon to be Interim President on October 1st. Uh, currently, uh, she serves as Chief Academic Officer of the University, uh, and she works closely uh, with Deans, Vice Presidents, uh, and other members of the President's Senior Leadership. Uh, she is responsible for the advancement of all dimensions of academic excellence, uh, including enhancing university's intellectual climate, fostering faculty collaboration and development, supporting innovative instruction and scholarship, and advancing diversity and inclusion. And I can attest to that personally in my uh, tremendous admiration and respect for her leadership uh, on advancing DEI here at University of Vermont. Uh, and she cre also helps us create an outstanding student experience, as many of you know. Uh, so, by uh, Provost Prelock and soon to be in our president. Good morning, everyone. And this is always the favorite. And Sandy, thank you so much for making this all happen. <laughs> Wonderful food, amazing music, great people amazing pictures, and just having alumni come back like our beloved Angela. So I'm thrilled to be here this morning, and I don't know if you've had a chance to experience the weekend. It's so glorious, but there's 
a buzz on campus, lots of families, alumni back, and really enjoying and appreciating the beauty of Vermont and the engagement that happens at the University of Vermont. We have faculty, staff, students, alumni, community members, and so a, a warm welcome to all of you who are here. As the mayor mentioned, we are gathering for our annual Andrew Harris Legacy Reception. And it's an event to really f reflect on the life and legacy of Andrew Harris. And as the mayor mentioned, he was the first African American to graduate from the University of Vermont in 1838. And wow, amazing. He went on to become a passionate abolitionist and pastor who opposed racism in the mid-19th century. It's also a special day to reflect on the life and legacy of Dr. Larry McQuarrie, who was here for 27 years at UVM, and he also was a champion of social justice and a leader in promoting our DEI efforts and strategies for combating racism. And although I didn't have the honor of working under him, he was the Dean of Allied Health Sciences for many years, and he'd left just before our department moved to that um, area. But I've heard so many amazing stories about his legacy and what he has done and uh, what he has left for us. So today we will give out the third annual award with his namesake, the D.H. Lawrence McCory Award for Inclusive Excellence to a dear, dear colleague and friend. These remarkable legacies connect to another who came through UVM and made lasting impacts on our campus and surrounding our community, none other than the amazing Dr. Angela Batista. During her time at UVM, Dr. Batista took on various roles as a graduate student and as an employee, beginning her professional career in the area coordinator for living and learning. Not an easy job, but one that she did with passion. When Dr. Batista arrived at UVM in 1997, she was the only student of color in her graduate program. Fortunately, we have since changed that. Her student engagement and university um, engagement and activism started only months after she arrived on campus, so we knew she was going to be a force to reckon with um, when she served as a student advocate and representative for a student of color who was harassed during a hazing by a local fraternity. During a protest of nearly 400 students, Dr. Batista ended up on the front page of the Burlington Free Press holding a megaphone as she spoke out about the incident. She was the voice for those who may not have voices. There is a poster among many in the back of the room that shows Dr. Batista and all of her energy and commitment to what's right in the back of the room. Following this incident, she became a member of an institutional response team with the Dean of Students, the President, and the Provost at the time. Unfortunately, I was not in those positions at the time. I was still trying to figure out how I fit at UVM. Um, but her student activism and organization continued while she was here. She worked with employees and students across campus to create community open forums, something that we've tried to continue to do, thank you, Angela, where they investigated and reported and documented bias incidents and created projects that assessed equity, um, access, inclusivity in UVM student services. And to this day now we have a bi bias response and education team that has evolved because of the initial work that you did. She later became Vice President of Student Affairs and Institutional Diversity and Inclusion and Champlain College. Our neighbors will forgive you for that. Um, continuing to bring change that was necessary to the Burlington community and beyond. Dr. Batista is a catalyst for change and inclusive excellence. She is now, as the mayor told you, an author, an international speaker, an inclusive um, leadership and organizational strategist and organizational consultant. And she is the founder and CEO of Transformation by Design. 
Today, we want to celebrate and honor the work of Dr. Angela E. Batista and those who came before her and after her time here, reflecting and honoring the critical work and activism that she engaged in, how it has shaped what our campus looks like today and guides us as we continue to grow as a university and a community. So thank you, Angela. Thank you all of you for being here today to celebrate this very important effort. Um, thank you, Amir, and your team. And Sandy, once again, you will always set the bar, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's so good to see you all here. I am Pamela Gardner. I am an alum and former staff member for a long time, as some of you know. It is my privilege to introduce Dr. Angela Batista today. Rather than list her impressive but Googleable credentials, I am going to offer more of a story. It's part of our Latina tradition to do so. I met Angela in September of 1997 when she attended her first Alianza Latinx meeting. She was a new graduate assistant in what we now call the Mosaic Center for Students of Color. It quickly became clear that Angela would be a positive force in the deeply wounded UVM community, which was still recovering from the 1991 water takeover and the establishment and eventual destruction by arson of Diversity University. But we're not going into that history now. The point is, when she arrived, UVM was still deeply divided and still had festering wounds. Not only did many students of color feel afraid, alienated, and angry, so did many faculty and staff members, regardless of race. Angela brought new energy, listening to students and seeking insight from faculty and staff of color. At the time, as Provost Prelock has just mentioned, there was no bias response team at UVM. Angela began distributing these bias incidents via email. Look, this is happening on your campus. You can't hide from it. This eventually led to those open fora that Patty just mentioned. She helped to increase campus awareness and the motivation to improve. People were coming out of their corners. She initiated the, the beginning of using Kente school st stoles at graduation, and one of the first graduates to wear those stoles is in this room. She brought Jane Elliott to campus. Do you remember Jane Elliott, the blue eyes, brown eyes experiment? Uh, if you haven't heard of her, those of you who are younger probably haven't, it was groundbreaking work. To, uh, it, she brought her here to campus and furthered the conversation. Remember, Angela was a graduate student. She did all this as a graduate student. She already learned to blend empathy and capacity building and would start her lifelong journey of uplifting communities. Well, maybe not start, but develop greater. She helped shift white people of good intention to see racism both personal and structural that battered people of color daily. She helped uplift the community of color and bridge the huge divide with the majority white community. Mosaic Center students, inspired by her brand of activism, named an award after her that is still distributed annually by the Mosaic Center. Since leaving UVM, she's blended community building with strategy, eventually progressively holding more responsible positions, serving in VP roles at several universities, you can Google her and find out, <laughs> and becoming the elected leader of NASPA, Student Affairs Administrators in Higher Education. That's a national organization, as Amer alluded to, of people in student affairs. She is a leader. Eventually, she founded her own business, facilitating transformational planning with individuals, college, university, and hospital boards and executives, as well as organizations around the world. After this award ceremony was announced, 
one of Angela's former students, a Sudanese immigrant who had faced monumental challenges to get to the United States and eventually attend college, wrote to her. I quote, I was very pleased to read about your honoring. You work for the betterment of all communities with an open heart and mind, end quote. He goes on to express, and I'll paraphrase here, you cultivated this learning in me too. And now I present Dr. Angela Batista, 2024 Andrew Harris Legacy Honoree. Buenos dias. I'm going to take a moment. I'm not good at celebrating. I didn't even go to my PhD graduation, my doctorate graduation, whatever it was. So I'm just going to look at you for a minute. <laughs> um, I moved to Vermont three times, you know. I don't know. I had to work out some issues, apparently. Um, but I love Vermont. But this is the first time I was telling Patty, uh, this is the first time I'm back in a way that is just for me. It's not uh, to do work, it's not to, you know, it's to see my people, it's to be here. And it's very beautiful to be able to be in this room um, as a former student and have all of that beautiful experience recited to me because, you know, we don't usually stop to think about what we do often, especially when we're trying to create a change that is also for us, right? So thank you, um, everybody. Um, I'm going to try to stick to my script because I know this is going to be emotional. Um, of course, I'm deeply grateful for this honor um, to the university, to the Alumni Association, uh, and the Division of Inclusive Excellence, and so many of you that brought up my name and um, made the decision to honor me. It is absolutely humbling. Thank you, Pamela, for that wonderful um, introduction and Patty, beautiful, our marriage is lovely. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to say, where's Herman Moore? Herman, can you stand up please? Yes, that's my friend Herman Moore. He was in the counseling graduate program before I came. So I just want to know that Herman was the first because that's important. We're here to celebrate legacy. Thank you, Herman. Um, you know, I, some of you may have heard this story, but I actually ended up at UVM because of a movie. Anyone here ever watch Baby Boom? Uh, some people. I'm old, I know. Okay, hang in there. So, Diane Keaton, 1987, Diane Keaton plays uh, this uh, executive, marketing executive, who has this life in New York, in Manhattan, and she ends up inheriting a baby from a cousin that died in England. And of course, that changes her life. And eventually, you know, imagine what happens. She ends up moving to a rural place in Vermont because she used to entertain herself looking at pictures of states in Vermont, which she bought on scene, right? And she comes and, you know, it is rural Vermont, so I don't have to tell you the story. I have to tell it different when I tell it away from here, but here I don't, so I won't. Um, but I was a fairly new immigrant, and I was still learning English, and when we were watching the movie, we rarely watch American movies. We were watching it in WPIX in New York, and I remember I said to my mother and my brothers who were in the room, I'm going to live there someday. And I remember my mother made a remark like, it was the scene where she just falls back in the snow or something like that, and she was like, yeah, you'll last three minutes and all that snow. We're from the Caribbean, right? So I've had this picture on my mind about um, this place, except I was learning English, and you bring those strange things when you're learning a language. So when I heard Vermont, I didn't hear Vermont. I heard Mount Vernon. My brain translated it to Mount Vernon because I had actually driven through Mount Vernon once. And so for years, I had this picture of Mount Vernon, which I knew was in New York, right? So when I had the chance to go to grad school through a program that helped minority students who were going into education, the, the, the director kept saying, you need to apply to UVM. And I was like, I'm leaving New York. I keep hearing, like, I'm here in New York. I'm leaving New York. He actually had to show me a map and say, this, find New York City. And I went here, and he goes, find Vermont. And I said, and he goes, this is Vermont. You know, I was like, oh, or this way. I was like, wow, it's a state. I had to go and rewatch the movie. 
So I was all set to go to Purdue, um, and I was supposed to tell Purdue the day um, on Monday in a, week, uh, in a week, and before that, I got a call from Rosemary Gravelin, who was at the counseling center, and she said, we want to fly you in for an interview. And at the time, it was the beginning of JetBlue, and they were giving away those flights so that you can fly, you know, fly uh, admission students to UVM, right, for, for students of color. And so um, they all knew I was poor. They were like, we'll fly you in. I'm like, but I'm going to Purdue in my head because I had to give them an answer, right? But it's Vermont, and now I know it's Vermont, so I, maybe I'll just take the trip. I'll go, and it'll be fine. Um, Rosemary, who knew what, I, what my life was like from my materials, actually invited me to stay with her family that weekend. So I stayed in the residence hall for a night, I believe, and then I spent the weekend with them, and they drove me around. Um, so that was the start of something beautiful, but I'll tell you about that in a moment. Um, and, of course, I was in the movie, so you know what happened. And then I went to the counseling program, and um, I it was interviewing with my beautiful sister and friend, Brady Katzman Rooks, who's here, and Dr. Eric Ronis, who's back there. Thank you, Eric, for being here, and Bill. And Eric said, what, what are you, you know, it's counseling. What are you all going to miss from being here? And I just started bawling. And I said, I'm going to miss my niece, Selena. Selena, there she is coming with her son, right? <laughs> Selena was four, and that's what I was going to miss, so I just started crying. So, of course, I had to come. I remember getting on the phone, you know, this is before internet and all that stuff, email. So I remember calling, and I said, I'm going to come here because it's going to be like going for therapy for free. That's what I said. I literally said that. But I really just, I was in the movie, and I fell in love with Vermont, and I fell in love with the people, right? And um, I want to say um, just... This idea of honoring legacy is really important. The said data, Moore is also back there. She was also a student of color when we were here. Um, and there were many of us that were doing this work and trying to create a better inclusive environment, not only for others, but also for us, for ourselves. Um, in learning a bit more about Andrew Harris, um, I'm struck by the courage and determination it must have taken for him to be here when I know what it took for me to be here, for us to be here. Um, I can only imagine the challenges and the outright discrimination that he must have experienced every day. I believe I heard that he had to accept his diploma off stage. Um, Harris's legacy as a trailblazer, abolitionist, and advocate for racial equality reminds us that someone must be the first, always. For there to be change, there has to be someone who's willing to be the first. This resonates with me personally and all that you heard. I've been the first in many ways. As a first generation student and professional, as a queer woman of color working at six, seven, PW, seven PWIs in my career, um, it's hard to be the first. It takes a special kind of courage, no matter what level of first you're trying to do. My journey is my family's journey. And so I want to take a moment to acknowledge my family who's here, some are watching. My loving parents, Maria and Pedro, who did not have the opportunity to pursue an education, but managed to get us all through college and become professionals. Yes, thank you. My brothers and sisters, Bertrand, Luis, Carolina, Pilfa, Reina, Erica, thank you. And my much-loved nieces and nephews who represent all of our hopes and dreams for the future. Selena, Chelsea, Gabriel, Brandon, Emily, Eleanor, Carlos, and my great nephew, Engasso and Elias, he's four. <laughs> and he's very active. <laughs> Thank you for always supporting me. We, we've been reminiscing a lot, and they've been talking a lot about how they've traveled to six different states and every place, and who went to that house, and who saw that house, and who saw this one. So it takes a village for sure. My own likely journey, as you heard, started here in 1997, um, and it was both daunting and exciting. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. During that weekend, um, I remember I saw Rosemary's legs. I think she would love me telling the story. She would laugh. And I looked at her. She was walking in front of me, and I said, those are the whitest legs I have ever seen. <laughs> and if you know me well, you know I would say that, because I think out loud, right? And that was the beginning of a beautiful relationship. 
You've heard about everything that I worked. There's a couple of things that were interesting in. So I was an intern at the Counseling Center for two years. Um, I also um, managed to um, follow Herman and Lisette managing Jean Mans, which was a graduate hall before I became a, a, an air coordinator when I graduated. Um, I also worked in the provost for some, in the provost office for a summer. I worked with Sherwood in the Allen House for a summer. It was every, I was everywhere. I was like, you have me to go. Plus, I was also an operator on the weekends because, you know, I was poor. So it was all, you know how we do. That's what I was doing. So um, while my time here was clearly um, not without its challenges, it was also a time of immense growth. I vividly remember the incident that was mentioned with the Acacia hazing incident um, when a student of color was harmed as part of a fraternity scavenger hunt. I'm going to share only public information, okay? Um, that moment brought me into the fold of uh, university leadership and activism. I had only been on this campus for three or four months at the time. I was completely over my head, but I had no idea. That's the best kind of good trouble. In a true first-generation mindset, I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, but I was fortunate to work alongside and learn from amazing, dedicated leaders, including Leon Lawrence, Wanda Heading Grant, Sherwood Smith, and many others. Together, we worked to respond in, in efforts to shape UVM's um, inclusivity efforts for the future. One of my most valuable experiences was the chance to be part of the design and launching of the new LGBTQ plus university center and being in the search committee for the hire of the first director. This is where I learned to become a higher education leader. There were also lots of challenging moments, um, hate mail, threats. An interesting public fact is that as a graduate student, I was sued with the president, the vice president of student affairs, and Leon Lawrence, who was the director, as a result of the Acacia incident. All these experiences helped me to find my voice, to learn about the power of advocacy, and to build lifelong relations and connections. But what I remember most about those years are the relationships in the community that I found at UVM. Without them, I would have never survived, and most importantly, I would have never thrived. My experience at UVM gave me lots of gifts in the form of chosen family. It would take a long time to name everybody, but I want to mention two special families. The late Rosemary Gravelin and P. Gravelin, along with their daughters, Danielle and Michelle. I know Danielle and Adam are here. Thank you for being here. Yes. These families, um, the second family is Brady's family. I almost skipped my notes. Brady, uh, Brady and I started the program at the same time, and we connected instantly. And when the occasion thing was happening, uh, Brady and Ali Lambert, who recently worked here, the three of us were like the trio, right? Because Brady had just come from Taiwan teaching international students. I was focused on working with students of color and Ali was focused on LGBTQ issues. And so I'll tell you some other things later that we did. It was amazing. But Brady and her family and her parents, Bonnie, Richard, her children, her siblings, partners, grandchildren, almost 30 years of just everything that a family does. Thank you to these two families and Pamela's family and everybody else who has made me feel like I have multiple families in Vermont, and I do. You are all my family. And most importantly, I am part of your legacy because you helped me to become who I am and to do what I have been able to do. Um, I want to uh, just say that Amir uh, talked a little bit about uh, sort of, you know, the, this sort of national work. You, this, I learned to do it at UVM, right? UVM is the national leader, right? I used to go to ACPA. I went to one ACPA when I was a graduate student. Um, and you, those days, I mean, it's not like now, right? It was really like UVM and ACPA. It was like UVM and Maryland were the two, and they still are, right? You still are, but we're better. But I'm not going to say anything, okay? Don't tell Patty I said that, the other Patty, okay? But that's another story. Um, but I learned. I didn't know I was learning higher ed, right? I didn't have a roadmap. I didn't have a blueprint. I didn't know. I, was, I had worked in K through 12 before coming here. I wanted to be a teacher. Then somebody said, you need to be a school counselor because somebody said you can do that. I didn't have an idea of what I could be. And so coming here and being thrown into a space where, yes, I chose to do the work. 
but I was invited, accepted, and encouraged and supported in doing that. If that hadn't happened, my experience would have been differently. So um, my personal uh, in, in mission and professional mission has remained very steady. I, I work to facilitate the creation of spaces where people can find belonging. That's what drives me every day. And what I have learned is that belonging is not something that can be wholly created for you. You have to be an active participant. You have to contribute. It's like having an ally. No one's going to be a good ally if you don't tell them what you need, unless it's by luck, right? The best allies are people that you have an understanding with of how they can support you. Belonging is a similar uh, process in my experience. I have intentionally and strategically chosen to work collaborative with allies, but especially with those who are not allies, those who don't understand me, those who may not accept me, those who don't know me or what I'm trying to speak about. I have chosen to strategically leverage my intersecting identities, my experience, my lived experience, my family experience as strengths that I can build on to build connection, to get to know people, to create safety for people to be themselves, or maybe brave spaces. I don't like safety because who's safe? No one's safe, right? I wonder in that vein what it might have been like for Andrew Harris. What did he experience? Did he experience a sense of belonging anywhere in this campus? And if that was true, what made that happen? Um, my work, you know, it's really interesting that I wonder um, what he would tell himself every day to just get through campus, to get to class. Where did he find the support that I had? Who were the people that understood his experience? We can't honor his legacy without seeing the reality. And while I agree with you, Patty, it's, oh, I think it was Pamela, sorry. Going down that road, we don't need to, but we cannot forget the history. And so in telling the story of Andrew Harris, let's be proud that in 1838 he came here and he graduated and he got a degree and all these things. But let's also be honest, because if we don't talk about where we've been, where we are, and where we're going are not as informed as it can be. So you're still gonna get someplace, but the quality of where you get, it's really informed by that. So who we were, who we are, becomes who we are going to be, whether we want to or not. You might as well, as well do it by design. You might as well strategically think about where do I wanna be and how do I use those things to learn from that. And that is what I think about when I think of Andrew Harris. So what does this mean for us, right? Uh, this work takes all of us, at work, at school, at church, in the government, in politics, in our communities, it takes all of us. Now more than ever, communities are in need of creating a network and a village to support people to do this work. And you must continue to do this work. The university must continue to do this work. I was fortunate to be embraced uh, by such a village here at UVM and to have so many others who believed in me and who supported me, who helped me see that I was smart, that my voice mattered, that I could help, that I could make my own experience better. Be courageous and be intentional and never forget that change is built one step at a time. I have, a, I have lots of angelisms that I use in my work. One of them is you cannot take an institution where it's not ready to go. And it is not about limiting people. It's about understanding how do you use where you are to move just one step? What relationships do you need to build to move just one step? You just need to decide one step. We get so overwhelmed by deciding on the whole thing and trying to get control of the whole process that we don't do anything and we become paralyzed. So my, my ask of you and my call to you is that you take a step. So I encourage each of you to think about what's the impact that you can make. Think about all the small things that had to happen for me to be successful here, for students to be successful here. Danae is back there. Hi, Danae, raise your hand. Danae is connected to BSU on campus, and we were talking a little bit before, right? And I said to, to them, I need you to, I, I said, you're not asking for advice, you know. I'm a, I'm a Latina, we always give advice. So I was like, you have to take care of yourself. 
It feels like without you, the work is never going to get done. It feels like without you, the change is not going to happen. This is not true only for DNIB work, right? This is true in all the roles that you hold, no matter what position you're in, at this institution or anywhere else. It feels like it is life and death. And it is. But if you're dead, you can't do anything. Okay? So you have to work where you are. You have to meet people where they are so that you can move forward together. Thank you once again to UVM for this great honor. I want to take Sandy and Masha and Krista, who's not here. Thank you so much for all your care in this process. This is an amazing event. Yes, let's give him a hand. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just leave you with this idea that thank you so much for honoring me and honoring Andrew Harris. The best way you can do that is by doing your work. Not, not the institution's work first, your work. If you do not do your work, you are going to be no good to the institution. Whatever your work is, you have to do that first so that you can be in the room with other people who agree, who don't agree, who care for you, who don't care for you, and still do the work. That is what it takes today, and it's painful more than ever. And it is not just about advancing DNIB anymore. It is about just not going back so much that we cannot come back. When I work with presidents and they ask me, you know, what should I be doing? Just keep one string alive. Like they're all gonna fall <laughs> somewhere. Just keep one string so that when it swings back, you can come back and that you don't have to build the string. Whatever that looks like for you in your life, in your work, in this community, you have a responsibility to do that. Andrew Harris's journey and my journey was about more than just us. Your journey here is about more than just you. It is up to you. So honor the legacy by doing the work and understanding that whatever we go through now is never going to be as hard as what Andrew Harris and other people before us went through. And if they did this, we can do it. It's about the how, it's about the strategy. So build a strategy, do it, and do it every day. And when you forget, give yourself grace and start again. Thank you so much for this honor. I am truly, truly humble. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pasista, for your inspiring stories and words of wisdom. We're taking it to heart. Hello, everyone. I'm Jadine Santos, Assistant Director at the Mosaic Center for Students of Color. And today, I am here to present this year's Dr. H. Lawrence McCrory Award for Inclusive Excellence. This is an annual award that recognizes a UVM faculty or staff member who self-identifies as BIPOC and who demonstrates a commitment to inclusive excellence, anti-oppression, social justice, and fighting discrimination. The third annual Dr. H. Le Lawrence McCurry Award for Inclusive Excellence is presented to Marie Vea. <laughs> Marie is the Assistant Dean for Student Services and Staff Development in the Rubenstein School for Environment and Natural Resources. Marie was nominated by numerous people this year, all with glowing statements about her impact and work on campus for the past 25 years. To name a few, Marie authentically and consistently creates both inclusive and supportive environments for people and communities of color. Whether it is her critical work with the University Diversity Council or her welcoming energy at the Black, Indigenous, People of Color Environmental Collective events, or her consistent work with partnership high schools, Marie's impact is widely felt. She has helped build out racial equity practices within UVM's admissions system, has advised students of color on her career development, 
and continuously names the ways our educational philosophies and approaches would benefit from pointed reflections on the inherent racism as a means of dismantling those approaches to benefit all students. In addition, she organizes BIPOC spaces of joy and celebration and merges UVM BIPOC community with the greater Vermont communities of color, creating opportunities to see and be seen in the outdoors. Marie is not here to accept her award today, but her colleague and our friend, Dr. Akol Agwak, will accept the award on Marie's behalf. Thank you so much, uh, my colleagues and, and friend, <coughs> Jadine Santos. I'm not supposed to say anything other than reading uh, the, the few remarks made by Dr. Marie Ver. Uh, everybody who has been to UBM has a story, and especially if you are a BIPOC person. So I'm not going to talk about my story. The only things that I can mention is uh, 22 years ago, it was Dr. Marie Ver that gave me the entry into the University of Vermont. And he thought I would leave after four years, but 22 years later, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Marie Ver could not be here because he was not aware that, that he would get this award. And so she had prior commitment that she cannot change. So she wrote these few remarks that I will read to you, and that will be the end of it. <clears throat> so, <laughs> so here is what uh, Dr. Marie Ver wrote. Uh, thank, you, thank you to the UBM Division of Inclusive Excellence, to the Dr. McCrory Award Review Committee, to those who submitted nomination with a special recognition to all the nominees. Congratulations and deep gratitude to Dr. Angela Batista, who for many years has supported and inspired me. And thank you to Dr. Now me. I, I just became a doctor on Monday. Dr. <laughs> Akola. <laughs> Dr. Akol Agwek for graciously accepting this award on my behalf. Words failed me when I first heard that I had received this honor in memory of Dr. H. Lauren McCrory's commitment to inclusive excellence, anti-oppression, social justice, and fighting discrimination. To be named in this company is so humbling. When I reflect on my 25 years at UBM, I can see clearly that I have been inspired and energized all this time by the commitment, wisdom, courage, and joy of so many others, a student, a staff, faculty, and friends, far and wide, who are likewise committed to this important work. I'm especially grateful to my Rubinstein School colleagues who have been tireless partners toward leaving our mission to heal and radically change human environment system in a just, equitable, and ecological direction. This award honors the countless people, places, experiences, and stories that are part of who I am and what I do. It is my privilege to work alongside all of you and may we together continue to serve our communities with commitment, courage, creativity, and joy. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, uh, JD, and congratulations, Marie. Uh, I believe you may be watching online. I know we're a little over time, uh, but I uh, want to please indulge me for just a, one more moment. Uh, first, uh, I want to thank once again Dr. Angela Batista for your just powerful remarks. Thank you so much. And one remark you made about the, all the little things that we do, all the work that we do add up. Um, as you may be aware, we uh, have a Inclusive Excellence Action Plan that was released a year ago. And in a, f in a couple weeks, we will be releasing our year one annual report. And what uh, the UVM community and the external community will find are all those little things that are adding up uh, that is taking UVM uh, forward and building on your legacy, building on uh, uh, Dr. McCrory's legacy, building on Andrew Harris's legacy. And so all of this work that we do here at the University of Vermont, it, it all builds on the work that's happened before and it takes us forward into the future. So I am distinctly honored to play my role to be standing on the legacy of Dr. Wanda Heading Grant, my predecessor, uh, and uh, thankful that uh, we have a leader in Provost Prelock and soon to be interim president that has been a champion the entire time I have been here and I'm very incredibly grateful for your leadership. Uh, we have uh, some more programs later this academic year that I wanna remind you uh, about. Uh, uh, we have the Martin Luther King uh, um, celebration on January 30th, and we will have uh, Dr. Anthony Jack, the author of Privileged Poor, uh, coming for, for that event. And we also have, will have our annual Inclusive Excellence Symposium March 17th to 21st. So please save those dates. I want to thank everybody who has come out and taken your time this morning, both here in person and those of you who have joined the live stream. Thanks so much. I want to thank Sandy Bermazan, the lead organizer of this program. Thank you so much, Sandy. Every single year gets better and better. I want to thank Masha I want to, uh, for all her great work. Krista Walter, as mentioned before, and the entire Inclusive Excellence Division uh, for all your great work. Uh, thank you all, and thank you to Los Songoros. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And I hope we get to hear a little bit more. And thank you all again. Take care.